this next one is probably the most controversial topic, but I feel like I have to cover it. The question I'm most often asked is how do I get into knife making? Or what does it take to make knives? Well, I can say it takes a lot of motivation, education, inspiration, and a lot of aggravation. Now, is this a one-time knife or serious hobby? Right now, let's go over a few topics that may help you determine what path you want to take. I highly recommend learning as much as you can about the craft before you go out and spend a bunch of money on tools and material. Everything from the type of steel to heat treating is just some of them. There's a lot of books out there on the subject, whether it's stock removal or forging knives, but one of them I highly recommend is by Dr. Laren Thomas called Knife Engineering, Steel, Heat Treating, and Edge Geometry. It is a gold mine of information. It will dispel a lot of myths and legends out there about steel use just pure tested science. Going to hammer ins and workshops is another way, taking classes. There's nothing like hands-on experience when learning any craft, especially knife making. Find a local knife maker or go to one of the classes that the American Bladesmith Society puts on. They have them several places in the country. There's also DVDs, downloads, and the internet. Just be careful what you watch and learn from the internet. Not everything on the internet is true but I think you know that. The key thing is qualified instruction. Try to get your training and learning from those sources. Go to the American Bladesmith Society's website. Find a local smith in your area. They may put on classes. That's an excellent way to shave months and years off of your learning curve. Nowadays, there are dozens of steel choices out there. Everything from your basic high carbon steels to your high performance stainless steels like MagnaCut. MagnaCut was developed by Dr. Laren Thomas, by the way. One requires less equipment control while the other requires precise temperature and environment control. You're gonna need a high temperature kiln, some quench plates, liquid nitrogen to control and heat treat MagnaCut. So you can see the range of different requirements depending on the steel choice you use. There's also the use of repurposed steel, such as old spring steels, plow steels, rasps, files, that sort of thing. While it's not something that I would use to make and sell, it is certainly steel that you could use as a beginning knife maker to learn the craft. While I don't like it because I don't know the exact make of the steel, therefore I can't do proper heat treating, it is still something you can learn on. But basic high carbon steel is not that expensive and you know how to heat treat it. That way you're not experimenting and getting frustrated when you don't know why it's not heat treating properly. Now you can make a knife with very basic tools. You don't have to have a bunch of fancy equipment to make knives. Now if you're making a bunch of knives, you may want to move on to some more tools. It's more efficient. But you can take a file and a hacksaw and make a knife. Take a hacksaw, cut out your blank, then take a file, cut the bevels. Now you'll need a drill of some kind to put holes in it for the handle, but it can be done. It'll also let you know right quick whether you want to go more in depth and buy more tools. I see it all the time. People go out, buy a whole bunch of tools. They watch this popular TV show, go buy these anvils and all kinds of tools. And a month later, you see them listed on eBay. Just make sure it's something you want to do before spending a bunch of money. But here's a few tools that you'll need if you want to go down that rabbit hole. Now, one of the first tools I recommend is some kind of metal cutting bandsaw, like a porta band. You can mount it in a vertical position, put a table on it, and you've got a way to cut out your knife blanks. Now they make tables you can buy that are made for porter bands, but or you can just do like I do and make your own. You'll save a ton of money. And speaking of making your own tools, if you look around my shop, you see a lot of tools I've made over the years. It'll save you a lot of money. And you can use that money to buy more advanced tools or materials or whatever you may need. I know a lot of people say that takes time away from making knives, but if you can make a knife, you can make a lot of these tools. Now, if you ask 10 makers what is the best knife grinder out there or what kind of knife grinder should I get, you'll get 10 different answers. A lot of that's because a lot of these makers only have used one kind of grinder. So naturally, they're going to suggest this specific grinder. But I can tell you there's a lot of good grinders out there. You just have to do the research, figure out what you want. 
the most popular being the 2x72 grinder, mainly because the belts are readily available and there's tons of attachments for them. But you have a lot of other kind of grinders out there. For a beginning maker, there's the 1x30, very limited, but you can get by with it. A lot of makers do. There's the 2x48s. There's a lot of different grinders. The most popular being the 2x72 because of the belts available and the attachments. Now, there are some options for buying a 2x72 out there or building your own. Many makers build their own. You can also get 2x72 kits like from Brian House with Houseworks. He makes a kit machine that you can buy and put together. Brian doesn't sponsor me. I'm just letting you know about it. I know it's a good machine. A lot of people use it. And if you can make knives, you can put this machine together and save a ton of money. Now, do you need a speed controller, such as a VFD, for your machine? No. Do you need a three-phase motor? No. You can use single-phase motors and drive pulleys to control your speed, like I have for 30-plus years. Would I like speed control to VFD? Of course I would. But this is just more affordable for me, and I've always used it this way. So my point is, you do not need a VFD, three-phase motors, all of that stuff, to have a good grinder. I recommend a horse and a half at least to two horse, and you can use drive pulleys to control your speed. Now you're gonna need some kind of way to drill pinholes or bolt holes for your knife handle. There's a lot of small drill presses out there that'll work just fine. Now you may wanna upgrade later to a beefier, more sturdy model, but the small drill presses will work. Even a hand drill will get you by. Now you can certainly send out your blades for heat treating, especially if you're making stainless knives. A lot of makers outsource their heat treating and you can guarantee a good heat treated blade when you get it back. But if you want to do your own heat treating, you're going to need a forge or a high temperature oven or kiln to do your own heat treating. A forge will allow you to do most high carbon steels, do your thermocycling, get it ready to quench. But you're going to need a high temperature kiln or oven to do stainless steels. You need precise temperature control, hold time, and all that stuff. A quench all will be needed for your high carbon steels, depending on what kind of steel it is. Don't be led down the road of just using any old kind of oil to quench your steel in. Use properly engineered quench oil for your steel. Depending on the steel you use is gonna determine which quench oil you use. So to know that, we'll come through some of that education I was talking about. So make sure you use proper quench oil. It's engineered for that purpose. If you want the best, performance out of your steel, use good engineered quench oil. For stainless the steels, you're gonna need your high temperature oven, some quench plates, cause it's air hardening, and you're gonna need a dewar for holding liquid nitrogen and or some kind of way to hold dry ice for sub-zero quenching. For tempering, you can use household oven or your electric kiln, but be aware some household ovens have big temperature swings, so make sure you monitor your temperature some kind of way. Now, if you're gonna be forging knives, of course, you're gonna need an anvil, hammer, tongs, something to hold your steel with. Anvils are expensive, especially since that popular TV show. Now, there's a lot of used anvils for sale out there. Just be careful with that because a lot of folks wanna charge you the same price as a new one for an old wore out anvil. It's better off just buy the new anvil. Now, there's some cheap anvils out there, especially that blue one from that cheap tool company I would steer clear of it. You'll be dissatisfied with that quick. But I've heard of some other companies out there that's offering anvils right now that's pretty reasonable. You can find some of these reviews on YouTube. I would just be very careful. A lot of these reviews are coming from people that had the anvils give to them by the company. So you gotta take that for what it's worth. But I personally know a couple people that have them and really like them. You can also ask around your family. Maybe your grandfather has one out in his barn rusting. He'll give it to you. You can also do like I did and use an old rusted railroad iron. Then you're going to need some tongs for holding your blade. You can buy tongs. There's a lot of companies out there that sell them, or you can make your own. But if you're new to forging, you may want to buy you a pair first. There are several different kinds out there, blade forging tongs. I prefer to make my own now because I can make them precisely for what I want to do. For hammers, you can get a cheap two and a half pound hammer and you're on your way. But you can use a big ball peen hammer or a small sledge. When it comes to anvils, just use what you have and move on to some better equipment when you can. 
Now, depending on how in depth you want to go, you're going to find yourself needing more and more tools. Most of this is want and not need. But you'll find that there are several tools that will help you increase efficiency and that sort of thing. For me as a full-time bladesmith, it's about efficiency. For example, I use this mill back here to cut guard slots. But for years, I used a drill and files to make that slot. But milling slots helps me be more efficient and more accurate. And I can't spend a lot of time on one knife. I mean, you're going to need various hand tools like files and file guides, disc sanders, pin presses for making bolsters, arbor press, cutting torch, welding machine, vices for holding your equipment, forge press, power hammers. There'll never be a bottom to the rabbit hole of tools that you're going to want more than need. If you're making knives, most of them is going to need a sheath. If you're like me, most of the knives that I make are for outdoorsmen, whether it be leather or kydex. Now you can have someone make these for you. Many people do, there's nothing wrong with that. Sheath making is a whole nother skill, but it's something that I wanted to learn how to do when I started making knives, so I learned them both at the same time. Just like knife making, educate yourself and learn as much about it as you can, then start making. The tools needed for sheath making is minimal. A table to cut out your leather, place to do the tooling, some kind of support under the leather, leather craftsman hammer, and your stamping tools. You don't have to stamp your leather, but if you're making leather sheaths, you're gonna to wanna to learn how to do it eventually. For kydex, you're gonna need some kind of way to heat up your kydex. You're gonna need a press like the one I made right here to form your kydex. You're gonna need some kind of way to install your eyelets. I use this arbor press right here, converted with eyelet dies in it, and I can press my eyelets into the sheath. You don't really need a whole lot of space to make knives, especially if you're just making an occasional knife, a small time hobby. I started out in the carport storage area of my home many years ago. It was like six by 12, had a four foot workbench. I had an old crappy four by 24 Sears Craftsman belt grinder, a vise, and a porta band. And I started that way and I made several knives there. Then I graduated to a 12 by 24 building with an extension for outdoor work. And I made a ton of knives in there. Now I operate out of a 30 by 40 shop and I feel like I need double that size. Again, it is want more than need. You don't have to have a lot of room to make knives. It just depends on how many tools you wanna to cram in there. And of course, I'm always wanting to cram more tools in here when I can get them. Power requirements is another thing. Even in my 12 by 24 shop, I had a 200 amp service in there. I had welding machine, 220 volt equipment, so I needed more power. So whatever you do, make sure you use a qualified electrician that follows the regulations, NEC, and your local ordinances for your power needs. My current shop has a 200 amp service and meets all of my needs. But if I wanted to run some three phase equipment, I'd have to either get a phase converter or have three phase brought into my shop, such as running big power hammers or lathes or equipments with big three phase motors on them. That's not something that I need, but something you need to think about depending on how far you want to take it. Beginning knife makers, people want to get into knife making, don't have to consider too much of that, but at least the minimal requirements and make sure someone qualified helps you determine what you're going to need for power. Safety is another consideration and a very important one. Make sure you have fire extinguishers in your shop. Make sure you follow local ordinances. Going back to your power requirements, an improper wiring job can cause fire in your shop. But just the nature of what you're doing in your shop, grinding, forges, sparks everywhere, fire extinguishers are a must. PPE is another thing. Glasses, gloves, footwear, protecting your lungs, respirators, that sort of thing is a must. The stuff you're doing in your shop, steel, handle material, creates some very hazardous dust and particles in the air. You get that stuff in your lungs, can cause serious issues, illness, or death. Make sure you cover those bases. Improper tool usage is another one. I see a lot of people using side grinders with one hand holding their steel with the other. Put it in a vise, use two hands, and cut your steel. Very dangerous. I've seen some very serious accidents in the industrial world by people using side grinders improperly. I lost a friend a couple years ago to a knife buffer. Very dangerous machine. We all get careless in our shop, but it's very important to pay attention, stay focused on what you're doing, proper tool usage. That way we can come home to our families. And as my good friend, ABS Master Smith, Steve Schwarzer would say, when you think you have arrived, you have just started.
I hope you got something out of this today. And if you got any questions, leave a comment below. And if you'd like to support the channel, there's a link to my Patreon in the description. I thank you for watching, and we're going to see you on the next one.